going now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> So for those people joining us, I'd just like to say welcome to this Hangout on Air hosted by Lonely Planet. My name is James Kay, and today we're going to be talking about round-the-world travel. Uh, when we say round-the-world travel, what we really mean is long-term trips happening over a long period of time, or multi-destination trips where people are traveling through a lot of different countries or a lot of different territories. Uh, and I'm joined today by three really seasoned travelers. We have uh, on, our, on our panel Jenny Walker, who is a very experienced Lonely Planet author. We have two travel bloggers, both also really experienced travelers. We have Nate Roberts, who blogs at yomadic.com, and we have Ariane Morris, who blogs at beyondlighty.com. Uh, we have a list of questions we're going to work through with these guys, uh, but if you want to ask any questions yourself, you can always tweet us using the hashtag LPHangout, or you can use the uh, comment function on this Google event page to post your questions there, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is just get the three of you to give us a brief uh, brief introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourselves, and in particular about your your traveling lives. So Jenny, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, for sure. Thanks very much for the introduction. My name's Jenny Walker, and I've been writing for Lonely Planet for well, over a decade now. Um, I started traveling when I was about 16, and um, I had a, um, a New Year's resolution to see one new country every year. I guess an awful lot of people have the same resolution, but being um, quite pedantic about it, I've stuck to it, and I think I'm up to about 112 different countries now. And um, I'm resident in Muscat in Oman, which is a very beautiful country in the Middle East. And uh, anybody who's out there looking for um, the motivation to go traveling, I think I'd say to them, yes, get up and go and do it, because it's, oh. it's, it's wonderful. Fantastic. 112 countries <laughs> in itself, I think, is probably an inspiration, certainly to me. Um, I don't know about you, Arwen. How, how many countries have you clocked up? And, and just tell us a little bit about your traveling life. I'm not actually sure what my number of countries is, but um, I set off on a seven-month trip to South America two <laughs> years ago. and. Um, instead of heading back and thinking, yeah, I'm done with travel now, um, it inspired me to go over to Australia on a working holiday visa. Um, and then once that was over, I was going to break up the journey with a couple of weeks in Asia, and then that turned into a three-month trip through Mexico and Central America. So I'm currently in Cancun and due to come back to the UK in November. So you're, you're, truly, you're con continuing your role, if you like, traveling. Yeah, well, I've been over two and a half years by the time I get back. <laughs> and you mentioned you're in Cancun, Mexico. One thing I didn't say before, this is truly a globe-spanning enterprise, which is testing the limits of our technological know-how. Um, obviously, Jenny's in Oman. Uh, we've got Ariane, who's in Mexico. And Nate, you're, you're in Serbia. So tell us a little bit, little bit about your traveling background. Um, I, I guess uh, pretty similar to Ar Ariane when I, I left Australia a little over two years ago. Um, at the time, I think I said, we'll give it six months and, and see how it goes. And yeah, it's you know, now into the third year of travel and uh, absolutely loving it. So I, I've been across the world and, and back a couple of times and find myself in Belgrade, Serbia right now. Fantastic. But just to stick with you, just for my first question, um, sure. where, do you, where do you get your ideas and your inspiration when you're kind of planning ahead for the next stage of your, of your trips? Um, look, I don't do a hell of a lot of planning. That's that's the first thing, um, and I think, you know, it's just things like, for me, it's it's movies, television, books, popular culture, um, hobbies that I might be interested in. Just, um, you know, I, I have the flexibility and the time to decide. Well, um, I kind of like the look of the um, the architecture in Eastern Europe. I'll go and hang out there for a few months. Can you think of an example of? Um a recent place you visited where you maybe read about it in a book or saw it in a film and just was seized by the idea of it and wanted to go? I guess, um, you know, especially places, uh, beachy sort of places, that's the imagery that really grabs people. So when you see uh, movies that feature tropical scenes, it's like, well, that, that's a cool looking beach and, you know, whereabouts is that? So I did find myself in Sri Lanka fairly recently um, after watching some crazy Bollywood-type movie. Uh, and the beaches were really nice. 
Fantastic. Um, and what about you, Jenny? I guess the answer for you in terms of inspiration and ideas is a little bit different because you're you're a professional author. Um, but talk us through. You know, perhaps you have tra travel on top of stuff you do as a professional. What about your ideas and inspiration? Oh, it comes from all sorts of different sources. I'm very lucky to travel for my job and and also for the travel writing. But um, to give you an example, um, I was once in. Um, in Vietnam and sitting under some bamboo groves and there were some very uh, inebriated artists with me and they were all talking about post-modern travel and how they were going to do a piece of work that would extend across different countries of Asia and I thought, hmm, one or two more Mekong whiskies and I don't think they're ever going anywhere and I thought, well, perhaps I could do this so one of the best uh, multicultural country journeys I've ever done was to become a, a mobile curator, for want of a better word, and I walked this project through uh, all the small towns and villages of Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos that was on a, a random axis, if you like, and right across the Silk Route down through the Karakoram Highway, and that's what eventually brought me to, to Oman. And on the way, I um, I was lucky enough to ask all the different artists that I met to contribute a page of the book. And now this book is uh, probably about, um, well, 36 feet long if you unwrap it. <laughs> and uh, there's at least 56 different artists in there and it's been exhibited. And there's a wonderful sense of connection of countries through that project and that that was a good motivating sure, sure. factor. So it sounds like there's a common thread in the sense that culture is a, a, a big driver of our ideas um, when it comes to where we're going to go. What about you, Ari? I, mean? um, I would say partly from reading other travel blogs um, and mainly from other travellers who I've actually met on the road. So for example, when I was travelling in South America, I made friends with a girl from Sydney um, and just after I said goodbye to her in Brazil um, she went to Mexico and I just headed back to the UK briefly to sort myself out for Australia and she Skyped me and she's really really seasoned, seasoned traveller and she called me and she said I've just been swimming with whale sharks that's the best thing I've ever done and I could see the excitement in her face and ever since then that was on my bucket list and I went and did it yesterday and it was incredible I even wow. planned my Central America trip around it because of the timing of the season. I couldn't yeah. start in Costa Rica and come up to Mexico. I had to start in Mexico. But How incredible! How it incredible. Well we, might, worth it. we might ask you to 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 uh, expand on that experience a little bit later in a bit more depth. Um, but just on the on the same subject, you said you came back to the UK briefly to, to kind of yeah. sort yourself out. Is how you put it. One yeah. of the things a lot of people, a lot of listeners, will be interested in is um, how do people prepare for a long term trip. Um, I mean, the way I would prepare for a trip is definitely start early, make sure that you know what kind of vaccinations you might need if you need any visas, that kind of process can take a long time, obviously you can end up with your passport in the embassy when you're about to get on a flight and it could be quite stressful, so definitely plan ahead. Um, I'm a big fan of putting a lot of time into planning a trip, um, I tend to do quite a lot of research, read blogs, read Lonely Planet, make a list of places that I absolutely have to see. Um, and then I tend to sort of plot those places on a map and try and decide what the most, um, the quickest route to get in between them would be. Mm -hmm. um, and then I tend to have a Word document where I write a potential itinerary day by day. <laughs> so right. people think I'm a little crazy going this far. Um, but I never actually book anything. So the idea is that I can be as flexible as I like, but I have a really good idea of how to get from place to place. I've got lists of the companies that I think I'd want to use for certain activities um, and then if I do change my mind on the road or I spend longer in one place than I anticipated it's a lot easier to rejig the rest of the plan and still arrive at my place where I'm flying home from on okay. the right date. So that's quite, that's quite a high level of organisation. What about yeah. you Nate? Oh uh, Nate, did you say Nate? Sorry I just lost yes. you there. Yeah. Look, I, I do pretty much the exact opposite, which is uh, <laughs> I, I just decide where I want to go and I just go. And, and look, there are some places where you do need to do some planning. So I, I'm always going to look into the basics like health issues, like currency, you know, things that you can't avoid. 
Uh, but in general, I, I just pick up and go. OK. I've got a related question here, which is coming on Twitter. Um, if you're the kind of person who just literally gets up and goes, yeah. would you would you just travel with, with carry-on luggage, or would you actually pack a suitcase or a backpack and, and put some thought into what you're going to take with you, or is it literally a spur of the moment? No, I, I've, got a, the plane? I've got a backpack that's not much bigger than carry-on luggage, and the only problem is the season. So I'm in summer right now, but in a month or so, I'll, I'll be in a snowy winter, and I, I've got to somehow get you know winter clothing with me. But uh, apart from that, I, I just throw things out from one season to the next or give them away and, and carry on. I, I need to travel light. That's, that's just the way I do it. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, now flexibility is something that Ariane mentioned there. Jenny, obviously, the, the scenario for you is sometimes rather different in that you might be traveling to go out and do a lot of heavy lifting research for a book. Um, how do you build flexibility in, into your kind of itinerary when you're planning a, planning a long duration trip? Mm, that's a good question, actually. In the past, I, when I was just traveling for fun, I never planned anything. It was a, the whole focus was on getting enough money to buy the ticket, and, and then I'd worry about it when I got there. Um, but now, I have to be super planning, planned, and um, I do try to think about what interviews I want to conduct on the road. I see if I need to meet any officials. Um, I have to plan how much time I can afford to spend in one place or another in terms of, of use of time because many people might think that uh, it, as a Lonely Planet writer you spend most of your time on the road. Um, in my experience that's, that's not the case. An awful lot of your time is spent in the pre-planning uh, and the research stage back home so that you're ready for what you need to find out when you get there. And then, of course, the bulk of the time is writing up afterwards. So I guess I fall somewhere in between the two, my, my two colleagues here. <laughs> yeah, OK. There's a real spectrum there. Um, Ariamon, I just wonder whether this, this one might be perhaps something that you've experienced. Have you ever booked a around-the-world ticket, one of these composite tickets where you're, you're uh, literally globetrotting all on the one combined ticket? I actually haven't. Um, the closest I've come to that was when I went to South America. I used the same website to book my flight from the UK to Colombia and my flight home from Brazil back to the UK. Yeah, but you chose um, you chose separate flights so, as opposed yeah. to doing that. Yeah. And, and why did you why did you decide against using a round the world ticket? I think because at the time I didn't know that I'd be then going to Australia and then back across to Mexico. Okay. Um, if I'd known that originally, then that probably would have been a cheaper way to do it. But at the time, I saw it as just one trip. Uh, and the easiest way for me is just to look at flights online. Um, what I would say, though, is for anyone who is planning to do what I did and fly into one country and out of another one that's quite far away and cross the land borders in between, is to be aware that some airports, when you're flying to another country, ask you for proof of onward travel out of the country that you're flying into. And that can be quite frustrating. Cause sometimes it might mean that you have to buy an extra flight that you're not going to use and then hopefully try and get your money back from that. Sure, absolutely. As a related question to you, Nate, um, mm. the cost of long-term travel, obviously a lot of people turn to around-the-world ticket because sure. there is a perception that by taking one of those combined tickets as opposed to making up an itinerary built from separate ones, you're going to be yeah. making a big saving. Sure. Um, generally, the cost question, the budget question when it comes to traveling over a long period of time is probably foremost in people's minds when they're contemplating a really big trip. Um, how do you keep costs down when you're on the road? I, I think the, the number one tip is just slow down. Um, so, you know, rather than staying at, at a particular city or a particular beach or whatever it might be for one night or two nights, you stay for a week and per night the accommodation is going to work out a lot cheaper. Um, with, with the accommodation, um, you know the, all the different websites that allow you to <coughs> to book apartments these days. That that keeps the price down a lot as well. Um, again, traveling slow. So even if it's around the world travel, rather than just buying one big expensive um, plane ticket, you know you can make your way across the continent slowly. Whether that's uh, on the bus or the train or hitchhiking or whatever it might be. But the the point is when you slow down, it it, it just becomes cheaper. Okay, and Jenny, I'm interested to hear your take on on how you budget. Um, 
wonderful though Lonely Planet is, we're, we're mm -hmm. not known for making our authors into millionaires overnight. So um, <laughs> you guys operate on a tight budget. How do you do it? Well, I think with with the budgeting side of, of travel, it's I don't mind where I sleep. I, I sleep on a sand dune. I can sleep in. I've slept in rainforests. I've, I don't mind bed bugs. I don't mind insects of any kind. And so I'm very happy to to take shortcuts there. But where I would say not to take shortcuts <coughs> is when the when there's a, a, an admission price to be paid. I think it's really important to go to those big sites. Don't don't skimp on that. I, I've met many travels, travelers around the world, and it seems such a pity they're there, right next to Guatsu Falls or, or Victoria Falls or wherever, and and they're not going in because of of the admission price. And I think, well, I, I think that's that's not a place to to save cost. Where I think you can be a little bit uh, uh, savvy is is often hotels organise. Um, mini bus trips between villages or between towns in remoter areas often that's that's well worthwhile because if you try and work out your own routes in some of these places it can prove more expensive than you imagine if you have to factor in a in a, a taxi because you've got stuck somewhere or it's taking you an extra three days to be in a in a place where you're not really interested in being so the I think my take on this is there's times to take shortcuts and times to uh, spend out a little bit. Yeah, sure. Ariane, what about you? Because you're, you're obviously confronting this problem, I'd imagine. I certainly did when I was on, on, a, on a long trip. It was always a bit of a headache to try and work out how much I could afford to spend. Um, how are you dealing with it? Um, I completely agree with Jenny. Um, I would say try to save on the cost of accommodation. After all, that most of the time you're asleep, you're not really missing out on anything. Um, I tend to stay in hostels. I tend to try and find hostels with kitchens so that I can cook my own food. Um, another way to save quite a lot of money is to travel on overnight buses because you're paying for the bus, but you're not paying for accommodation that night. And they're actually quite comfortable. In the whole of South America and Mexico so far, I've had a good night's sleep on overnight buses. Um, Another thing that I would say is if it's possible, try to maybe find work while you're traveling. So if you are staying in a hostel, maybe you can volunteer and get free board and still have a bit of time to go and see things. If you've got a particular skill that you think you could use, like perhaps teaching scuba diving or teaching a foreign language um, while staying in a hostel, quite often they're looking for people who can do that. Um, and maybe look at working holiday visas. So I just extended my travel by a year by going over to Sydney and working a six-month contract there, which allowed me to save and then be able to buy the flights to come over to Mexico. Okay, some great tips there. Um, you've also kind of transported me back to many overnight journeys I made in Mexico on long haul buses <laughs> and emerging from those journeys kind of bent double, uh, which brings me <laughs> on to my next question, which is um, how, do you, how do you stay healthy when you're, when you're traveling for a long period of time? Because you're kind of taken away from the kind of routines you might have at home, and it can be a little bit challenging, I think, on that front. Also, there's other things like food and hygiene and all the rest of it. Um, would you have any tips for people on that front? That's to Ariane um, first. Um, I would say like the most important things are to make sure that you have your vaccinations, to make sure that you've got comprehensive travel insurance so that if anything does go wrong, you can be treated for it. Um, if you think that you might have an issue, obviously go and get it checked out as soon as possible. Um, I make sure that I, I'm not too picky with things like street food. Um, I think that you can go overboard with being too careful with things like that. But definitely, if you go to a place where they suggest that you drink bottled water I and mean, listen to that advice, that you probably will get sick. Mm -hmm. um, also, I try to include quite a lot of activities um, in my travel plans where maybe I'm hiking or scuba diving or being quite active, and that enables me to say a bit fitter than I would otherwise be. Okay. What about you, Nate? Um, I'm so irresponsible. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> this is a theme, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I've never had a vaccination or anything like that, but I, I think the important thing is that traveling is a really healthy thing to do. So, you know, obviously it's really healthy for your mind, so that's that taken care of. Um, but you tend to, to walk a lot more than you would if you were sitting, let's say, at a, at a desk at Lonely Planet in England or, um, you know, wherever it might be. But um, I just find that I'm healthier when I'm traveling than when I'm not at home. But 
you, know, you eat fresh food, you, you drink water and you do all the usual sort of things, but I, I don't think health is as big an issue as some people think it might be for travellers. Okay. Jenny, anything to add to that one? No, not really. I think uh, I agree with the other two, except I, I must admit I do have no vaccinations. <laughs> because, yeah, I, I've had malaria and that wasn't very nice, so I tend to take the malaria tablets too. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, and eat lemons. And eat lemons. Yeah. Lemons. Yeah, okay. yeah, great source of vitamin C and always does a trick for me. All right, okay. <laughs> we'll note that one. Um, when, you're, when you're about to set off for a trip, trip Jenny, um, what are the first three things that go into your, your backpack? <laughs> Oh, um, hairbrush, because I think it's quite important to, how, what, wherever you've stayed the night before, it's quite important to be able to spruce up a bit in the morning. Um, and a journal in the old days, when you used to travel a lot for long periods of time, multiple countries, you don't remember all those wonderful first impressions for very long. So it's quite, I, I think it's quite fun to put them down. And it's also very good company if you're in countries where you're not able to communicate very easily with the language. And of course, a Lonely Planet guidebook. Um, of course, of course. Stuff, <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be my three things, I think. Okay, what about you, Ariane? Um, I always take a padlock. Um, I think there's a lot of hostels that have lockers, and it's a good idea to use them. Um, I keep the key attached to a hairband around my wrist because once I had my bag stolen with my key in it and after the ordeal of having my bag stolen and then went back to the hostel and realised I couldn't get into my locker. Um, keeps it accessible if you've been on a night out as well, it's a lot more a lot more useful. Mm -hmm. um, I got a really handy shoulder sling for carrying bottled water when I was in Bolivia and I've got a lot of jealous comments from fellow travellers on this trip. <laughs> and also um, a multi-purpose charger with adapter. I think um, it's quite difficult sometimes when you're traveling these days with a camera, a GoPro, a laptop, smartphone, Kindle. <laughs> yep. You end up with a lot of things that you need to keep charged and if you can find a really good multi-purpose one that's quite compact that you can charge sure. different devices with at the same time then it's really handy. Okay, and, and that's interesting, that relates to what I was going to ask Nate as well. I mean, Ariam and Anne, you, Nate, you're both travel bloggers, you're producing fantastic content for, the, for those blogs all the time when you're traveling. Um, is there any kind of indispensable travel tech that you take? Ariam has mentioned some devices there, but any apps or stuff like that that you really feel you couldn't live without, or do you basically just park all that while you're traveling and, and, and write stuff up when you come back? Um, but, you know, one thing I think is it's fairly indispensable these days is some kind of app that will give you a GPS functionality on your smartphone. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've been in the middle of nowhere and had more idea of where I am than, than the tuk-tuk driver that's that's taking me through the back roads purely because of the GPS app on the, on the phone. So, to me, that has become indispensable now. It's just such a useful thing. Right. Okay. Um, Talking of tuk-tuk drivers and uh, getting into taxis in foreign lands and all that kind of stuff, has anybody ever fallen foul of a travel scam? I know I have on many occasions, um, but what about the three of you? What about you, Jenny? Oh, yes, a fair few, I'm afraid. Um, I think one of the ones I remember was uh, children coming up with a cardboard box which they would aim around about your middle and then they would be distracting you above that box and then trying to pick your pockets below the box. <laughs> and you're so, you're so engaged with what's going on, the, the sort of pantomime at the, at the, uh, above the box that you, you really don't notice what's, what's going on. And they're very, um, they were very adept at it, I have to say. <laughs> Nate, what about you? Oh, you hit the nail on the head before with taxi drivers, so that's absolutely the most common one in just about every country I've ever been to at some point, you know, in some way a taxi driver has scammed me, whether that's just quoting too much or they've got the secret button under the dash that where the meter starts spinning too fast. Yeah. Um, you know, apart from that though, I'm, I'm lucky I've never had any major scams pulled on me, so... You know, I'm I'm kind of wishing one would happen just so I'd have something to write about. But I'm, I'm sure if, I'm sure if you keep traveling for long enough, it will. Although I wouldn't yeah, wish it on you. No, of course not. <laughs> what about you, Aramon? 
Um, I've definitely had uh, issues with taxi drivers, for example, quoting a certain price when there's more than one of you in the taxi, and then when you get out the other end, they let's say, oh, that was per person. When does a taxi ever do that? Sure. <laughs> um, the worst that happened to me was when I was in Madrid, and I was walking into a park, and a woman came over to ask if I'd sign a petition to help children who are deaf and blind. Um, so I started filling out a few personal details on this piece of paper, and then they asked for a donation, and when I got my wallet out, they actually took my credit card out of my wallet and said they needed to see it for ID purposes. Um, and then about five other women crowded around at the same time. And I wasn't sure if they were trying to distract me so that they could take something out of my bag, or if they were trying to memorize the details of my card to go along with the personal details I'd already written down for them. Um, so I kept my bag really close to my body, took my card back, and cancelled it immediately afterwards. Yeah, that sounds like a very kind of elaborate ruse that yeah. you, you were the victim of there. Um, have you ever, have any of you ever been to, well, I, I guess, could you could you kind of call up any places where you think having a bit of previous experience of travelling long haul really, really matters? I can think of a few countries where I'm glad that I visited them with a bit more experience than going there straight off the bat. Um, what about you, Jenny? Can you think of a place that kind of fits that description for you? Well, it's... Much as I'm very fond of the Middle East and it's my home and I love traveling around here and I feel completely safe in doing so now, I don't think it's a country, especially for a single woman, to set out, uh, it's a region I should say, to set out into as a first time experience. I think it's very difficult to read people's expectations, you, you can very often give the wrong message. I think it's a fantastic destination but it's worth having a bit of travel under your belt before you get there. Mm -hmm. And Nate, same question to you. Um, one that comes to mind is Albania, and it's purely just because you know, places like that, the tourism infrastructure is not that developed. It's hard to get around the country. Um, so you've just got to have... Uh, I'd hate to turn up in Albania as the first place that I'd ever travel to. I mean, the, the capital city doesn't have a bus station, things like that. So, sure. Yeah. So, great places, but just it's worth having a little bit of. Oh yeah, Ama 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 amazing place. Yeah. 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 Ariane, when have you had anything that that would fit that kind of experience? Or. Yeah, I mean, there were parts of South America that didn't have the best reputation. Um, I started in Colombia, and I have to say, apart from someone stealing my bag very subtly from under a table, um, I found everyone to be very friendly and helpful, and I didn't have any issues at all. Um, cities like Quito in Ecuador, um, parts of Rio felt quite dodgy. Someone tried to steal my bag in broad daylight in Rio, which was a bit of a scary moment. Um, I think as I made my way through South America, I gradually became a bit more aware of things that could go wrong and the types of bus companies that might be more reliable. Um, I definitely picked up tips from other travelers, um, people who'd already been to other places and knew someone where something yeah. had gone wrong. Um, so yeah, the more I traveled, the easier it got. I think with learning Spanish, um, I'm not fluent by any means, but as I've traveled, that's got better and that's obviously made it a lot easier if I do have any problems to ask for help. Okay. And I guess definitely the experience is important. The, the opposite side of the coin is uh, what about a place that you think is absolutely perfect if you're, if you're you know, a younger person, you're setting out on your first long duration trip, maybe you're traveling solo, maybe you're not, but this is very much a kind of watershed moment in your, your traveling experience. Um, what would be the perfect place for you to go? I would, I would probably recommend Thailand. Um, my first backpacking trip was in Malaysia, and my second was in Thailand. Um, Malaysia is a little bit less travelled, so um, maybe a little bit harder to find your way around. But Thailand's very popular. Um, you'll meet a lot of people who can give you advice. Um, probably wouldn't speak Thai, but a lot of people speak English there. And it's also quite a cheap country. It's very beautiful. Um, there's a lot of different activities you can get up to, so it's a good starting point. Okay. And what about you, Nate? Um, firstly, I totally agree with Thailand. I love Thailand. Um, over here in Europe, I think that the Balkans is, you know, a lot of people go to Croatia these days, but um, all of the other former Yugoslavian nations have all got something different to offer. They're all fairly inexpensive as far as Europe goes. Um, 
it, it's a really great part of the world. Okay, and Jenny? I think it's quite important to aim for a country that has a, an established travel uh, trail in it. Um, for example, coming to somewhere like Oman is very, very difficult for backpackers because there's no, there, there isn't a tradition of other people doing that kind of traveling here. You go somewhere like Jordan, on the other hand, and there's a very established pattern of travel through the country. That does make it a lot easier if, it, if you're a, a first-time backpacker. And uh, I think it's very important to have a, a really good first experience on, uh, on the road because obviously you know, that, that's what draws you back again and again after. Yeah, okay. And I'm, I'm very interested to know um, if you could speak through the years to your younger self, a version of your younger self as you're about to embark on you know, your first major traveling landmark what would be the key piece of advice you would you would give to that that person, Nate? Um, the first advice I would give is just is just go. So, you know, a, as soon as you are capable of, of leaving and traveling, just do it. And I guess the second thing would be do it for as long as you possibly can. Yep, I think you're you're echoing the words of our, our founder Tony Wheeler there. Um, what about you, Jenny? Um, I think I'd say. For women travellers, um, say yes to everything, but if you mean no, make it clear you mean no. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> and Ari Amman? Um Yeah, mine's pretty similar to Nate's actually. I would advise myself to have started travelling sooner. Um, I used to go on short trips, but I waited till after university to start doing that, and I was actually 29 when I left for South America. So I'm probably quite a bit older than the average backpacker around here. And I'd say probably the average backpacker in South America is maybe a bit older. That's mm -hmm. probably about mid-20s. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend that I got started sooner. I think it's good to actually maybe work for a bit of time to so your finances are slightly better when you're traveling um, and maybe you're a bit more confident and you make more of the opportunities, but definitely don't wait too long. Okay. And um, what about an absolutely appalling piece of travel advice that you've been given <laughs> by someone that's turned out to be absolute bunkum? Um, again, I've, I've, I've certainly had a few of those. Uh, what about you, Nate? Have you, have you had, had any, any, any advice to forget? Yeah, definitely. It's mostly to do with countries that, you know, you announce, the big one for me was Iran. And as soon as I told people I was going to Iran, um, you know, the impression that everyone has is it's the most dangerous place on the planet, it's full of terrorists, don't go there, you'll get bombed, blah, blah, blah. And it, in fact, it's one of the safest, safest and definitely the most friendliest nations I've ever visited. Okay, great. Nate, uh, and uh, Ariamman? Um, I haven't really received any particularly bad advice, but one thing that I would make people aware of is that quite often people's opinions vary quite widely on what's actually a good place to visit or a good hostel to stay at, and it's important to ask why if someone gives you a recommendation. Um, for example, you know, someone's idea of the best hostel ever might be a massive party hostel where people are up until 6 o'clock the next morning. If you're more the kind of person who actually wants to get a good night's sleep, then you'll be getting up yourself at 6 o'clock in the morning and going off to do some activities during the day, then that's not going to be the place for you. Mm -hmm. Jenny? Um, I was once told, in fact several times I've been told, oh you can get in for free if you go through the hole in the fence. And <laughs> <laughs> as tempting as that sounds when you're on a, on a budget, um, I don't think that's very good advice for a couple of reasons. One is um, you don't necessarily need the trouble that follows, but um, I also think that it's quite important to contribute a little bit to to wherever you're traveling through and often the money that you spend on admission or on on buying crafts or whatever else it is, it, it contributes very meaningfully to the local economy and I think that's important. Yeah, okay. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you just had this incredible experience swimming with a whale shark. Um, it was yesterday, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, I mean that sounds like the stuff of many people's bucket lists. Yeah. You're a very experienced traveler. Do you actually have uh, like a bucket list equivalent, uh, a list of places that you, you dream of going, that you hope to go, or experiences you hope to have? 
Um, not as much as I used to. Um, South America was always the place that I really wanted to visit, and I actually put off going to any countries in South America on previous trips because I always knew that I wanted to do it justice by giving it a good six or seven months um, to get around. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of Latin America because I've just come back over here, um, and I would love to come back again in the future. Um, but one place that I actually have on my bucket list at the moment is Ireland. Um, it's like crazy that I've lived so close to Ireland for most of my life and never actually gone over there. So sure. I might add that one to the list for when I get back to the UK. Okay. And, and Nate, you sound like a very kind of in, in, instinctual, impulsive traveller to me. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you have a bucket list or is it really, you know, the way the wind's blowing, what, what takes your eye at the time? Yeah, I don't really have a bucket list, but one thing that I have been thinking about a lot lately is I've never seen the Northern Lights. Um, mm. So I want to go somewhere and I thought maybe somewhere like Greenland or you know somewhere where there's not going to be too many other people around and uh, and check that out. Yeah okay it was supposedly a very good year to see them um, well this this That's winter good. and next winter but they've been saying that for a few years now so oh, I wonder right. if there's okay. some marketing campaign involved. Who yeah knows? maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what about you Jenny? Oh, well, the problem with bucket lists is mine just keeps getting longer. So I keep thinking I'm knocking them off, and every time I have accomplish one, then I, I, three more drop in. So um, I don't think I'll ever be through mine. Um, but I'd really like to see a polar bear, and I, I love the wildlife watching, and so anything that, uh, that brings me closer to a, a wildlife experience is good for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, this is something that I know I experienced myself when I came back uh, from a year away. Um, I had a bit of a touch of the post-travel blues, getting back into a different kind of life. Um, do you guys have any advice for people who are facing that kind of situation? Ariane, when you've been back and you've been away again, your answer may well be simply travel more. I know that's, yeah. that's the answer <laughs> for people. Um, any other advice you can add to that? Um, yeah, probably my answer would be travel more. Um, obviously. I haven't dealt with the travel blues very well over the last few years because I have remained on the road and I'm actually quite concerned about how I'm going to feel when I come back to the UK. I'm not really sure what my plans will be, mm -hmm. um, but I may well stick around for a bit longer than normal. Um, I think if you've just come back from a trip and you don't have much money left and obviously you're upset that you're not going to be able to go on a big like round-the-world trip again, it's a good idea to... Just book a couple of fun weekends away, maybe a nearby country, maybe just somewhere really near where you live, just so that you've got activities to look forward to that maybe wouldn't cost quite as much to keep you going until you can afford the next round of water. Okay. And Nate? I've got no advice. It, ta it takes me about three days before I'm really depressed. And, <laughs> you know, pretty much just, yeah, travel more. I don't know. I've, I've got nothing on this one. <laughs> You're coming up empty there, I can tell. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Jenny? I think it's quite good to try and um, relate some of that traveling energy to your own country. And I, th I think we've probably all experienced that wherever you live at the time, you, you probably haven't seen the, the big sites on your doorstep. And uh, they, they're usually quite accessible and quite reasonable to, to manage. Um, and it's fun to think of your own environment as, as a travel destination. And that, for me, that helps push the blues away. <laughs> okay. Um, so I've got one more question myself, and I've got a couple of questions I just want to fire at you um, to see if you've got anything to say on these. Um, we've got a question from Kevin on two questions from Kevin on Twitter. One is to Nate um, asking about European trips, would you say that uh, using a car or going by train is the best way to go in your experience? In, look, they're both great ways to see Europe, but in my experience, um, it's the car. And uh, I purchased a car about, it was about a year ago now, for 350 euros. And I ended up driving it through 28 countries, and it, it did about 20,000 kilometers. Um, I just got to see so much. Um, you know, there's no timetables. You can go wherever you want. You can stay for as long as you want. So, for me, car is absolutely number one. But the train is great as well. But do the car. Okay. All right. Um, and my last question to all of you really is: um, I just wonder if you could pick out a single travel moment that really burns brightly in your memory, just to give people something to to think about as they go away and perhaps plot their next trip. What about you, Jenny? 
Well, I got lost in the rainforest in Costa Rica uh, many years ago, and um, although it was pretty terrifying at the time, and I was overnight lost, so uh, um, it was the most unbelievable experience because every time I was about to despair or feel that, okay, get me home, get me out of here, um, something wonderful would happen. I'd see, um, I saw a porcupine, or I'd see a, a, a particular primate come down from the from the trees and just look at me, and and it was a really remarkable experience. And I, I don't think you can plan or script those moments. So, they, they happen if you put yourself in places where you have the opportunity to experience something extraordinary. Okay, and Nate? Um, following on from the, the car, so I, I crossed a really remote border between Georgia and Armenia and the, the border guys couldn't really speak any English, I can't speak any of their local languages or Russian or anything like that. What started off as I thought they were trying to bribe me um, turned into them looking after us for the next three or four days, paying for our hotels, paying for every meal, paying for everything as, as guests of the country. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it's the it, it's the human experience, the the cultural experiences, and they they happen all the time. And I think it's the best thing about traveling. Okay, and Ariaman? Yeah, I'd have to say like. Quite often things can go quite badly wrong and you think it's the end of the world and it turns out to actually the best thing that happened to you. I've had um, I had a night bus once where I arrived at a hostel at 5 o'clock in the morning and the hostel people told me that there'd be a dorm room, a dorm bed available. Um, I'd just have to wait another seven and a half hours. So I sat outside waiting for this room to be available. They didn't actually tell me when it was, so when I went to ask they laughed at me and said, oh, the room's been ready for an hour, I can't believe we've been sitting outside. Um, and then I unpacked my bag and I was just desperate to get in the shower after my night bus and four people arrived to a four bed dorm and they said, oh, we've got a res reservation. They suggested that I pay full price for a private room, which I wasn't particularly happy about. So eventually I just said, you know what, I don't want to give you my money, I'm going to find somewhere else to stay. And I ended up meeting someone who's now one of my best friends. I went to stay with a family in Sydney when I first arrived there. and. If that hadn't have gone so badly wrong, then I wouldn't have that friend now. So I think you know, try to stay mm. positive about these kinds of experiences, and usually it will work out for you. Sure, I think that's the serendipity of travel in all those three stories, isn't it? Um, okay, well I'm going to call a close to this now. I just really want to thank all three of you um, for downloading on us. I think there's some absolutely brilliant advice in there, and I hope uh, anyone who's joined us has, has enjoyed it as much as, as I have. If people do want to find out more about Around the World Travel, inevitably, of course, Lonely Planet does have a page dedicated to this subject, and you can find it at lonelyplanet.com forward slash around the world travel. If you want to find out more about Nate traveling around, you can visit his blog at www.yomadic.com, um, and equally, you can go and find out what Ariane Wen is up to at www.beyondblighty.com, and uh, I recommend both of those. They're, they're a great read. Uh, so thanks very much to all three of you. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I hope uh, people have feel they've got some advice out of it. Thanks, James. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.